Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the radio ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for this series, and I'm speaking today with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian, and Amy Russell, a former New Ager, who is uh, bringing some needed warnings to the church about how the New Age is creeping in. We spent the last few episodes talking about yoga, and the last week we talked about how yoga is being introduced to the church and kind of ended touching on meditation, and I think we would like to pick up there. Meditation now seems to be a key component of yoga, but what is the real purpose of that? Um, So just to reference a Bible verse, Matthew 6, 7, and when praying, do not use vain repetition like the pagans do, for they think that in their many words, they'll be heard. So it's the concept how God tells us, he not only tells us how to worship him, he tells us what not to do. And the idea behind breath prayer and contemplative prayer is using that vain repetition, and that leads to the altered state. And So I wanted to discuss about um, the mindfulness meditation and it's like, is it mindfulness or is it mindlessness? So the pretext of new age mystical metaphysical practices all converge on the concept that we can be like God. So we empty our mind so that we can access the God within. And however, to do this, we are to not use our God-given mind. We are to stop the mind from functioning as God created it to do. The New Age meditation is dubbed mindfulness meditation, a clever oxymoron. So we are to dismiss all thought, reasoning, and questions under the ostensible premise that thoughts are a barrier to enlightenment. Drop within yourself to open your mind, but don't allow your mind to function. Don't ask questions, but trust that you're elevating your awareness. Elevate your awareness, but don't employ reasoning. We are told to enlist our feelings as a reliable bom- barometer, but feelings are fleeting and subjective. So by its definition, it's mindlessness under the facade of tapping into our source, our intrinsic power, while at the same time cultivating a blissful calm. And for a time, it does elicit these feelings, but they're just a temporary byproduct. They're not the ultimate aim. New Age meditation is the doorway between worlds. So opening our mind and allowing for this paradigm shift, we inadvertently become hosts for these parasitic demonic forces to latch onto. Satan draws us in with his craftiness. He does not disclose his true intention. So his intention is to draw us away from God. And these, these practices of new age and new age meditation and yoga draw us away from God. Satan uses these to obscure the lines between good and evil. So again, you're dealing in abstractions. Uh, Isaiah 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and bitter and sweet for bitter. So he's obscuring the lines. And so it, it, it takes away our discernment capabilities. So we're walking toward him, but we don't even know we're walking toward him in a way. So the purpose of this mindfulness meditation then is to actually empty our minds. Not having reason is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. The false teachers are like unreasoning beasts, according to... Yeah, groping in the dark. Right, so reason is a good thing. Uh-huh. We're actually told to reason um, based on what God has revealed in his word mm-hmm. and apply that to our lives. It's interesting, if you go all the way back to the Ten Commandments, when Moses was up on Sinai, the original Hebrews said he received the 10 words. But what that means is that God spoke using human languages that identify categories, okay? And I've I've talked about this many times over the last 35, 40 years of ministry, but the fact is even the 10 commandments require reason. And what reason in its very basic uh, nature is, is the ability to identify categories. A is not non-A at the same time and in the same relationship. That's the basic building block of logic that God gave us. And so when, when uh, Yahweh says to Israel, thou shalt not have any other gods before me, 
I am the Lord. I am your only God. Well, then it requires reason to identify those categories. Who is Yahweh who appeared to Moses at the burning bush, who appeared again at Sinai, who spoke audibly to Moses in human language that they could that Moses understood and, and demonstrated through um, the Passover that he is the true God and he defeated all the false gods of the Egyptians. So when he says, you shall have no other God before me, it takes reason to say, oh, the true God, here's what he did. Here's what he's like. Here who he's the one who brought us to himself. The false gods, they were all defeated uh, in the plagues in Egypt, and they're not really the true God. They didn't create the world. Remember, we cited before in this series, the gods that didn't create the heavens and the earth will perish from the heavens and the earth. That's in Jeremiah. So that's the basic idea is A is not non-A. God isn't the same as false gods. So, Amy, the reason they were telling you to, to downplay reason and just have an experience and experience your inner divinity was that's the only way to sell Satan's lie. Yeah. Okay. Because once you erase the categories, then the categories that are ultimately erased are that between the creator and the creation and the true God and the false gods. And so then you go down the rest of the 10 commandments. They're all based on logical categories. Every yeah. one of them, thou shalt not steal. Right. Okay. It's not yours. If you take it, you stole. That's a category. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. so when they try to get rid of categories, they get rid of moral law and they get rid of salvation and they get rid of humans being able to function as people who have or bear the image of God and need categories in order to be able to survive on the earth. So then this meditation removes the categories. But yeah, you empty your mind of all thought and reasoning. And you don't, you don't employ any type of, of um, reasoning or you don't ask questions because the thoughts are a barrier. You know, and God created our brains to work. So when we, when we empty the thoughts and remove all type of reasoning, that goes against what, what God told us. It goes against how he told us to use our minds. And he gave us his word so that we could read his word and know how he wants us to worship him and what he wants us to stay away from. So yeah, it removes the category so that you're no longer using the mind that God gave you to use. Right. So the ultimate lie is you should be like God. Mm -hmm. you know, the ultimate experience of Eastern religion is all is one. But if, there are, if all is one, then there are actually no categories. There are no such thing as categories. Right, right, no boundaries. Uh, famous apologist Peter Jones, who's out in Escondido, California. I met him out there uh, at a think tank that I was invited to some years ago. But he, he makes it real simple. He, he calls it one-ism and two-ism. Mm. So the East and all of the... Uh, forces in our society pushing us that direction are teaching one ism all is one whereas the bible teaches two ism there's the creator and the creation and those are not the same and they cannot be the same satan he not only blinds us to darkness and evil and this is what we we're saying he pers he persuades us to see it as light as good so as was my case i was looking to gurus for answers and guru translates one who brings you out of darkness into light, but they're doing the opposite. And so I began seeing evil as good because my gurus were telling me it was good, but man without God sees evil as good and good as evil. We're alienated from God. So you can't then expect these gurus who are trying to lead you into what they perceive as light to be telling you the truth. It's, and it's like when you apply the idea of Christian yoga, it's like applying this darkness and trying to call it light. It's the same 
idea. And after I became a Christian, I was throwing out all of my yoga and new age books and statues. And I noticed pictures of these gurus on the covers of the books. And I, I saw their eyes and they were evil demonic eyes. They resembled snake eyes, which would track because, you know, the serpent spirit attaches to a practitioner through habitual practice. But I finally was able to see the evil presence in their eyes because the, my blindness was removed. God gave me back my sight and he gave me back the discernment. And I, I just, I couldn't believe that I had looked at these, at these gurus and at these swamis and these, you know, um, yoga teachers as being so enlightened when their very eyes just looked evil. So it's like when God gives you that discernment, he, he allows you to see what's right in front of you that you weren't able to see before. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Jesus talked about if, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? How great is that darkness? Wow. And uh, it's, a, it's a miracle, Amy, that God uh, saved you out of that yeah. and let you see what was really going on because that whole process of trying to achieve oneness and being one with the light or whatever was really just trying to erase reality. Mm -hmm. That the creature is not the creator. The creature, everything that's created is finite and the, the entire creation is subject to, to what Paul calls futility. Uh, and uh, that means in, in science, we call that entropy. I studied that in chemical engineering. Entropy means that the amount of available energy in the universe is always decreasing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that means that we're heading toward heat death. There won't be enough energy to sustain the universe if the universe is infinitely old, but it's not uh, because we're not dead. The, the universe is still here. So it has a finite beginning at the point when God created the universe. Okay. And this is all a big lie that you're just going to get recycled or all is one, or you're going to find Nirvana or, or peace or enlightenment. But it, it, it's, I think in the Old Testament, it says, you, you say you are gods, but you should die like men. In the Psalms, you're going to die like men. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be what you think it is. <laughs> so the point of meditation then is to get into the altered state of consciousness. What is the point of being there? Um, we want to access the God within. So you can access your... Um, heightened state of consciousness. And then in that state, you know, Satan seduces us into thinking that by dropping within, it will allow us to reach this heightened state of consciousness. And then we can find our, our, uh, the God within, and then we can access the supernatural power. Um, we can access the Kundalini spirit. So that is what he seduces us into thinking. But in reality, we're reaching for nothing. There's no divine nature, no perfection to be found. You know, Jesus alone is the path to peace, fulfillment, and salvation. So there's nothing to find. Like I tried for 20 years. I tried. There's nothing there. There's nothing to find. It, it, you're, just, you're just moving toward bondage. And it's, it's like you're, you're dealing in the realm of demonic spirits. It's the realm of familiar spirits. And so all that's there is, is, tortured souls in torment. Wow. Did you ever, even at any time, feel like, well, I think maybe I have it now? Did you ever? Yes. Feel way? I, I, I did. And that's what I can say that people that try and um, mold this into Christian yoga or just secular yoga or any of these um, types of practices, they try and rebrand it, it does for a minute elicit these feelings of euphoria, just like extreme euphoria. And um, when, when you have those feelings, you want to continue to recapture them. Okay, so if you, call it, if you call it Christian, then it gives you that excuse. It's like, no, we're all coming together in worship. And so you're trying to elicit these feelings and then you can brand them worship when in fact, 
it, it's it's like you've opened yourself up and the spirits can enter and of course they're going to give you these stimulated emotions but then they they leave immediately they're fleeting and they're subjective and they're they're ephemeral so you can't hang on to them so then you keep coming back wanting to revisit those feelings but they they're they're fleeting and i remember the last time that i did a deep meditation i thought that i had tapped into my divine being i was convinced it was, i i went in i went into such a an intense trance state and i moved into a very extreme high and i crashed so hard that i became extremely depressed after that and that's when i started to question it so even when you would get to enlightenment yeah you can't hang on to back it. to darkness <laughs> real quick you and you go back to darkness to the extreme because you go to an extreme high and then you crash to the extreme low because i just thought oh this is it i've tapped into it i've this is what i've been i've been working toward and then i crashed within like 30 seconds and it, it was just this despair that came over me what do you think to me is going on with some of the people who seemingly spend their whole life in this um there was a lady running for president who's well known eastern person uh marianne williamson i think it was uh -huh. yep she yep. seems so kind of mellow and um uh, you know all is love and, and things like that maybe she sincerely thinks that's the way it is do you think there's some people who never have the crash? They just sort of feel good all the time? Um, I would have continued to do it. I feel like, I feel like it was because of my Christianity. It was because Jesus never left me that he showed it to me, but I would have continued to do it because it's like you're on this path and they keep telling you, well, maybe not in this lifetime, but you move toward it, you keep moving toward it oh. and things will start to open up, but just trust the process. Um, don't question the process. Again, don't use reason, don't question. Just continue to keep striving for that divine nature. You're gonna tap into it. But I feel like it was because Jesus was, you know, like I love Jessica's illustration of <laughs> like grabbing by the back of my collar and he's like, that's enough young lady, you're coming with me. You know, like <laughs> Jesus was like, he just never left my side. Amen. And I think without that, I think I would have just continued like, okay, well, that was just a bad day. I'm going to come back and do this again. You know, there's, there's a reason I'm on this path. I'm going to be, I'm going to find this, this hidden wisdom, this esoteric wisdom. And initially that lust of, for that wisdom was what drove me. And I think it would have continued to drive me had I not had Jesus waiting for me and, you know, patiently at my side to bring me back. It's true that Christ is the only way out. Yeah, um, it's true. Did you personally know anybody who didn't have the crashes or just stayed on the high all the time? No, I never, I never met anybody who just stayed on the high at all. Um, well, it's, that's interesting. It's like, I wonder if the ones that are writing books and getting on TV are just portraying that. It's hard to tell, but it's hard to tell and you know there always there's always these yoga classes of take it off the mat and into the world um and it's it's this idea of of tapping into that um enlightened state and bringing it into your everyday life and it's a constant struggle so i think everyone battles with that because it's really you you can't take that fleeting emotional high and bring it into your life on any consistency. So there's, there's nothing that suggests that people can actually do this, okay. but people just keep trying because I mean, what else are we going to do? You know, as a human race, if this is, if this is where we're headed, then we just have to keep heading in that direction. Otherwise it's, it's all for nothing. And that's what I had to come to terms with for myself was, was this all for nothing? Did I just invest 20 years of my life for nothing? And initially I wasn't able to accept that. But then as I continued to see the futility of it, 
I was like, I couldn't get away from it fast enough. Like, I don't even care that it's all for nothing. You know, I know Jesus is with me. I know he's my, I know he's my God. I know he's going to save me. So just get me out of here. But if you don't have that, then you keep striving for it because otherwise it, it, you're just left with despair of like, this was all a waste. You know, why are we here? Why are we here as a human race? We're here to like, you know, find enlightenment. And that's where we're headed. And if that's all, if that's all a lie, well, then what is, what is life even for? So I have a couple of um, acquaintances really from back in school that are um, very big into Bikram yoga. And one of them even has her own studio and does all this. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll see her post different things on Facebook and it'll be like, well, I left feeling so good, but this and that happened. And now I got to get back to the studio. Like, Ever, I hearing what you're saying about not being able to keep that high, it just seems so hopeless because every time something goes wrong, she's failed. And the answer is to go back and do more yoga. Yeah. Like the, there's, it seems like there's this constant almost chase of I need to get here and I need to grab hold of this. And every time I let go, I have to start over again. And yep. it seems so yep. hopeless. Yeah. I have a scripture here. I alluded to it. Let me just quote it. Mm hmm it's in Luke chapter 11. And I'm going to start reading with verse 34. The eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is also is full of darkness. Watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illuminated as when the lamp illuminates you with its rays. And so there's a warning that what you think is light, mm -hmm. is not actually darkness. Mm -hmm. The true light is, is going to stay what it is, light. And, and we'll never find that light going into an altered state of consciousness, not the no, true light. That just puts you into darkness and they're trying to keep you in the darkness. And the reason they're attacking reason and, and thinking about consequences and uh, opposites and alternatives and what's right and wrong, and what's true and what's false. Mm -hmm. They want to keep you from that because if you do that, start contemplating, you'll see that this stuff is dark. It is darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's not the light that it claims to be. And you'll look elsewhere to find real true light which comes only from Christ. And the same thing is not is applied not just to uh, yoga and mystical, but whatever it is somebody's living for that's really temporary. Uh, the same kind of warning is given in the Gospels to people who live just for pleasure or wealth or whatever, like the guy that builds bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns. And then at the end it says, uh, uh, thou fool. Today, your soul is required of you. Now, who's going to own everything that you live for? Yeah. yeah. So that comes to an end, too. Yeah, everything that anyone would live for is not eternal. It's not what God gives us, eternal life in Christ. It's going to come to an end, and it's yeah. going to be seen as futility. Yeah, like, I fell prey to Satan's devices, you know, and I was, I was a young adult and suffered from these psychosomatic symptoms. And for me, I grew increasingly agitated, isolated and withdrawn. And everyone's remedy was, you know, more yoga, more meditation. So following that logic, I was to apply the source of my struggle to fix the problem. And, but it was like, because I was raised a Christian, I just knew it, it was, I became, I became aware it was just futile. But yeah, like you don't want to admit that it's all for nothing. You don't want to, people don't want to think about they've, they've gathered all these riches, but for what, right. you know, in the end, it's like, for what it, it means nothing. It's like filthy rags. It means nothing. You know, all of our wisdom means nothing. And Bob, right. you told me that you told me that when I, when I came to you, when, when I was in church um, and I asked you. I said, I, I was struggling, you know, um, I was struggling with some oppression still after I gave my life back to God. And I said, I was still 
struggling. And, and you said, you know, you've been transferred to God's kingdom of light. And, you know, of course, Satan wants me to think that because um, I'm struggling, that maybe I'm still a little bit in the domain of darkness, but he wants me to think that because then I won't be focused on God. And then Satan can silence me. So he might not have my, my, he might not have hold of me anymore, but he certainly wants to silence me. So you said, don't look to the source of the problem to fix the problem. Look to God only. He's already delivered you. So it doesn't mean you won't have struggles, but God doesn't say to isolate from negativity. He dwells in us and he fills us with his Holy Spirit. So no matter what our circumstances, we are called to completely trust in him and give thanks because he's sovereign. So it's like I had that to hang on to after I came out of this, even though I realized it was all futile and I, maybe I wasted a bunch of years, but look what I got, you know, like I got, I, I have Jesus back in my life. What you, what you have is permanent. It's eternal. Yeah. And one of the verses I quote more than any other is Acts twenty six eighteen, which is Jesus telling Paul what Jesus wanted Paul to do as he was called to be an apostle and to preach the gospel. This is Jesus, what he said to Paul. Paul's telling Agrippa, Jesus told him this. Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That's quoting Jesus. Okay, so if you look at that, Already, when you come to Christ, you went from darkness to light. Mm -hmm. The dominion means whose kingdom are you under? Who's, who's in charge of the kingdom you're in? Well, you went from Satan to God. You left. Forgiveness of sins. That's the ultimate thing they don't have to offer. Yoga isn't offering forgiveness of sins. They're offering you an experience where the idea of sin or non-sin aren't, aren't even valid categories. They're just saying all is one. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about sin. There is no such thing. It's just negative vibrations or whatever. But here it says the sin is real, but what you receive in Christ is forgiveness of sins. And then an inheritance among those who have faith in me. The inheritance is eternal. Mm -hmm. And this is a gift from God that we're part of the eternal kingdom. And Jesus Christ said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And even though we came in late, maybe late in life, and we have regrets that we wasted so much time and, and so much uh, of our energy. Uh, a lot of people say that. I've talked to a lot of people. But God gives us the gift and the blessings, all of it as a free gift out of his magnificent grace. Mm -hmm. And it's not something we earn. So Amy, you have the same blessing and gift of an inheritance than, than anyone who comes to Christ. And then have been sanctified by faith in me. So sanctified, the Greek means to have been made holy. So in the, in the, Eastern religion version, you work, 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 and try to become some guru or shaman or holy person, some holy man, but that's all an illusion because they don't have any holiness. It's all just filthy, wicked garbage. Mm -hmm. But we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us uh, once for all, and we're sanctified because we're in Christ, who is the Holy One of Israel, and we're part of it. Not that we deserve it, but that God gave it to us. And so what a joy to see what God has done for you, Amy. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking well, about this as we, I was editing uh, one of the audios. I remember your grandparents, the Kellogg's, many years ago when I was a young pastor. and I'd go down there to the Wednesday night prayer meeting to run it, and there'd just be a little handful but there they would be, yeah. and your grandpa, uh, Bill Kellogg, would always pray with us and uh, was so thankful of how God had saved him. So what a miracle now to be here 
with you via Zoom. Right. Uh, the granddaughter of, the, of those dear saints that I knew when I was just a young man. Wow. Yeah. Praise God. Okay. We are almost out of time. So we will come back and talk more about mindfulness next week, as that is something that seems to be growing in popularity and it's coming again into the churches. And I keep seeing everywhere mindfulness for kids, Mind, teach your three-year-old mindfulness so they don't throw their temper tantrums. So we need to know what mindfulness is and why it's a danger for us. So for Critical Issues Commentary, this has been Jessica Kramis, Bob DeWay, and Amy Russell. We want to remind you that you can access this episode and all of our past ones, plus 30 years now, I believe, of articles on our website, cicministry.org. And we want to remind all of you out there, as it says in Philippians 1.27, stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. We'll see you next week.